29. The short guy who entered the squad room brought stench after him like a wake. He smelled like rotten bananas and wild root cream oil and cockroach shit in the inside of a city garbage truck at the end of a busy morning. He was dressed in a pair of aging herringbone pants, a ripped gray institutional shirt, and a faded blue warm-up jacket from which most of the zipper hung loose, like a string of pygmy teeth. The uppers of his shoes were bound to the lowers with crazy glue. A pestiferous hat sat on his head. Oh, Christ, get out of here, the duty sergeant cried. You're not under arrest, Hap. I swear to God, I swear it on my mother's name. Get out of here. I want to breathe again. I want to talk to the Lieutenant Bozeman. He died, Hap. It happened yesterday. We're all really fucked up over it. So get out and let us mourn in peace. I want to talk to Lieutenant Bozeman, Hap said more loudly. His breath drifted fragrantly from his mouth, a juicy, fermenting mixture of pizza, Hall's mentholiptus lozenges, and sweet red wine. He had to go to Siam on a case, Hap. So why don't you just get out of here, go someplace, and eat a light bulb? I want to talk to Lieutenant Bozeman, and I ain't leaving until I do. The duty sergeant fled the room. He returned about five minutes later with Bozeman, a thin, slightly stooped man of fifty. Take him into your office, okay, Dan? The duty sergeant begged. Won't that be all right? Come on, Hap, Bozeman said. And a minute later, they were in the three-sided stall that was Bozeman's office. Bozeman prudently opened his only window and turned on his fan before sitting down. Do something for you, Hap? You still on those murders, Lieutenant Bozeman? The derelicts? Yeah, I guess that's still mine. Well, I know who greased him. Is that so, Hap? Bozeman asked. He was busy lighting his pipe. He rarely smoked the pipe, but neither the fan nor the open window was quite enough to overwhelm Hap's smell. Soon, Bozeman thought, the paint would begin to blister and peel. He sighed. You remember I told you Paulie was talking to a guy just the day before they found him all cut up in that pipe? You remember me telling you that, Lieutenant Bozeman? I remember. Several of the winos who hung around the Salvation Army in the soup kitchen a few blocks away had told a similar story about two of the murdered derelicts. Charles Sonny Brackett and Peter Poley Smith. They had seen a guy hanging around, a young guy talking to Sonny and Poley. Nobody knew for sure if Sonny had gone off with the guy, but Hap and two others claimed to have seen Poley Smith walk off with him. They had the idea that the guy was underage and willing to spring for a bottle of musky in exchange for some juice. Several other winos claimed to have seen a guy like that around. The description of this guy was superb, bound to stand up in court, coming as it did from such unimpeachable sources. Young, blonde, and white. What else did you need to make a bust? Well, last night I was in the park, Hap said, and I just happened to have this old bunch of newspapers. There's a law against vagrancy in this city, Hap. I was just collecting them up, Hap said righteously. It's so awful the way people litter. I was doing a public service, Lieutenant, a friggin' public service. Some of those papers was a week old. Yes, Hap, Bozeman said. He remembered vaguely being quite hungry and looking forward keenly to his lunch. That time seemed long ago now. When I woke up, one of those papers had blew onto my face, and I was looking right at the guy. He gave me a hell of a jump, I can tell you. Look, this is the guy. This guy right here. Hap pulled a crumpled, yellowed, water-spotted sheet of newspaper from his warm-up jacket and unfolded it. Bozeman leaned forward, now moderately interested. Hap put the paper on his desk so he could read the headline. Four boys named to Southern Cal All-Stars. Below the head were four photos. Which one, Hap? Hap put a grimy finger on the picture to the far right. Him. It says his name is Todd Bowden. Bozeman looked from the picture to Hap wondering how many of Hap's brain cells were still unfried and in some kind of working order after twenty years of being sautéed in a bubbling sauce of cheap wine seasoned with an occasional shot of sterno. How can you be sure, Hap? He's wearing a baseball cap in the picture. I can't tell if he's got blonde hair or not. The grin, Hap said. It's the way he's grinning. He was grinning at Poli in just that same ain't-life-grand way when they walked off together. I couldn't mistake that grin in a million years. That's him! That's the guy! Bozeman barely heard this last. He was thinking, and thinking hard, Todd Bowden. There was something very familiar about that name. Something that bothered him even worse than the thought that a local high school hero might be going around and offing winos. He thought he had heard that name just this morning in conversation. He frowned, trying to remember where. Hap was gone, and Dan Bozeman was still trying to figure it out when Richler and Weisskopf came in. And it was the sound of their voices as they got coffee in the squad room that finally brought it home to him. Holy God, 
said Lieutenant Bozeman, and got up in a hurry. Thirty. Both of his parents had offered to cancel their afternoon plans, Monica at the market and Dick golfing with some business people, and stay home with him. But Todd told him he would rather be alone. He thought he would just clean his rifle and just sort of think the whole thing over, try to get it straight in his mind. Todd, Dick said, and suddenly found he had nothing much to say. He supposed if it had been his own father he would have at this point advised prayer, but the generations had turned, and the Bowdens weren't much into that these days. Sometimes these things happen, he finished lamely, because Todd was still looking at him. Try not to brood about it. It'll be all right, Todd said. After they were gone, he took some rags and a bottle of alpaca gun oil out onto the bench beside the roses. He went back into the garage and got the thirty thirty. He took it to the bench and broke it down, the dusty sweet smell of the flowers lingering pleasantly in his nose. He cleaned the gun thoroughly, humming a tune as he did it, sometimes whistling a snatch between his teeth. Then he put the gun together again. He could just as easily have done it in the dark. His mind wandered free. When it came back, some five minutes later, he observed that he had loaded the gun. The idea of target shooting didn't much appeal, not today, but he had still loaded it. He told himself he didn't know why. Sure you do, Todd baby. The time, so to speak, has come. And that was when the shiny yellow sob turned into the driveway. The man who got out was vaguely familiar to Todd, but it wasn't until he slammed the car door and started to walk toward him that Todd saw the sneakers. Low-topped keds, light blue. Talk about blasts from the past. Here, walking up the Bowden driveway, was Rubber Ed French, the ked man. Hi, Todd. Long time no see. Todd leaned the rifle against the side of the bench and offered his wide and winsome grin. Hi, Mr. French. What are you doing out here on the wild side of town? Are your folks home? Gee, no. Did you want them for something? No, Ed French said after a long, thoughtful pause. No, I guess not. I guess maybe it would be better if just you and I talked, for starters, anyway. You may be able to offer a perfectly reasonable explanation for all this, although God knows I doubt it. He reached into his hip pocket and brought out a news clipping. Todd knew what it was even before Rubber Ed passed it to him, and for the second time that day he was looking at the side-by-side -side pictures of Dusander. The one the street photographer had taken had been circled in black ink. The meaning was clear enough to Todd. French had recognized Todd's grandfather. And now he wanted to tell everyone in the world all about it. He wanted to midwife the good news, good old Rubber Ed, with his jive talk and his mother-fucking sneakers. The police would be very interested, but of course they already were. He knew that now. The sinking feeling had begun about thirty minutes after Richler left. It was as if he had been riding high in a balloon filled with happy gas. Then a cold steel arrow had ripped through the balloon's fabric, and now it was sinking steadily. The phone calls, that was the biggie. Richler had trotted that out just as slick as warm owl shit. Sure, he had said, practically breaking his neck to rush into the trap. He gets one or two calls a week. Let them go ranting all over Southern California looking for geriatric ex-Nazis. Fine. Except maybe they had gotten a different story from Ma Bell. Todd didn't know if the phone company could tell how much your phone got used. But there had been a look in Richler's eyes. Then there was the letter. He had inadvertently told Richler that the house hadn't been burgled, and Richler had no doubt gone away thinking that the only way Todd could have known that was if he had been back, as he had been not just once but three times, first to get the letter and twice more looking for anything incriminating. There had been nothing. Even the SS uniform was gone, disposed of by Dusander sometime during the last four years. And then there were the bodies. Richler had never mentioned the bodies. At first Todd had thought that was good. Let them hunt a little longer while he got his own head. Not to mention his story. Straight. No fear about the dirt that had gotten on his clothes burying the body. They had all been cleaned later that same night. He ran them through the washer-dryer himself, perfectly aware that Dusander might die and then everything might come out. You can't be too careful, boy, as Dusander himself would have said. Then, little by little, he had realized it was not good. The weather had been warm, and the warm weather always made the cellar smell worse. On his last trip to Dusander's house, it had been a rank presence. Surely the police would have been interested in that smell and would have tracked it to its source. So why had Richler withheld the information? Was he saving it for later? Saving it for a nasty little surprise? And if Richler was into planning nasty little surprises, it could only mean that he suspected... Todd looked up from the clipping and saw that Rubber Ed had half turned away from him. He was looking into the street, although not much was happening out there. Richler could suspect. 
but suspicion was the best he could do. Unless there was some sort of concrete evidence binding Todd to the old man. Exactly the sort of evidence Rubber Ed French could give. Ridiculous man, and a pair of ridiculous sneakers. Such a ridiculous man hardly deserved to live. Todd touched the barrel of the thirty thirty. Yes, Rubber Ed was a link they didn't have. They could never prove that Todd had been an accessory to one of Dusander's murders. But with Rubber Ed's testimony, they could prove conspiracy. And would even that end it? Oh, no. They would get his high school graduation picture next, and start showing it to the stew bums down in the Mission District. A long shot, but one Richler could ill afford not to play. If we can't pin one bunch of winos on him, maybe we can get him for the other bunch. What next? Court next. His father would get him a wonderful bunch of lawyers, of course, and the lawyers would get him off, of course. Too much circumstantial evidence. He would make too favorable an impression on the jury. But by then his life would be ruined anyway, just as Dusander had said it would be. It would all be dragged through the newspapers, dug up and brought into the light, like the half-decayed bodies in Dusander's cellar. The man in that picture is the man who came to my office when you were in the ninth grade, Ed told him, abruptly turning to Todd again. He purported to be your grandfather. Now it turns out he was a wanted war criminal. Yes, Todd said. His face had gone oddly blank. It was the face of a department store dummy. All the healthiness, life, and vivacity had drained from it. What was left was frightening in its vacuous emptiness. How did it happen? Ed asked. And perhaps he intended his question as a thundering accusation, but it came out sounding plaintive and lost and somehow cheated. How did this happen, Todd? Oh, one thing just followed another, Todd said, and picked up the thirty thirty. That's really how it happened. One thing just followed another. He pushed the safety catch to the off position with his thumb and pointed the rifle at Rubber Ed. As stupid as it sounds, that's just what happened. That's all there was to it. Todd, Ed said, his eyes widening. He took a step backwards. Todd, you don't want to... Please, Todd, we can talk this over. We can dis... You and the fucking Kraut can discuss it down in hell, Todd said, and pulled the trigger. The sound of the shot rolled away in the hot and windless quiet of the afternoon. Ed French was flung back against his sob. His hand groped behind him and tore off a windshield wiper. He stared at it foolishly as the blood spread on his blue turtleneck, and then he dropped it and looked at Todd. Norma, he whispered. Okay, Todd said, whatever you say, champ, he shot rubber at again, and roughly half of his head disappeared in a spray of blood and bone. Ed turned drunkenly and began to grope toward the driver's side door, speaking his daughter's name over and over again in a choked and failing voice. Todd shot him again, aiming for the base of the spine, and Ed fell down. His feet drummed briefly on the gravel and then were still. Sure did die hard for a guidance counselor, Todd thought, and brief laughter escaped him. At the same moment, a burst of pain as sharp as an ice pick drove into his brain, and he closed his eyes. When he opened them again... He felt better than he had in months, maybe better than he had felt in years. Everything was fine, everything was together. The blankness left his face, and a kind of wild beauty filled it. He went back into the garage and got all the shells he had, better than four hundred rounds. He put them in his old knapsack and shouldered it. When he came back out into the sunshine, he was smiling excitedly, his eyes dancing. It was the way boys smile on their birthdays, on Christmas, on the 4th of July. It was a smile that betokened skyrockets, tree houses, secret signs, and secret meeting places. The aftermath of the triumphal big game when the players are carried out of the stadium and into town on the shoulders of the exultant fans. The ecstatic smile of tow-headed boys going off to war in coal-scuttle helmets. I'm king of the world, he shouted, mightily at the high blue sky, and raised the rifle two-handed over his head for a moment. Then, switching it to his right hand, he started toward that place above the freeway where the land fell away and where the dead tree would give him shelter. It was five hours later, and almost dark, before they took him down.